not everyone gets to wake up or decide at a very young age, I want to become a happiness professor. And so I want to share with you really quickly, if I can, how I got to be where I am today and how my personal story as well as my professional life kind of converge. Um, as I shared with the high school students earlier, earlier today, I was one of those uh, super achievers. Um, uh, you know, 4.5 GPA, President National Honor Society, you name it, you know, um, excelled at it as everything, got into a top university. But all of that, all of that uh, pressure and drive to succeed miserably failed to help me overcome or deal with the, the, the biggest trauma of my life at the age of 27, my mother died from suicide. And so I was never equipped with the tools uh, growing up or in high school or in junior high, uh, or even college for that matter, to be equipped to deal with this trauma. And I say this because um, as educators, we're really here to deliver the next generation of humanity and, and, and to really inspire and to be a source of, 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 um, uh, of, of a resource and uh, a model to students as well. And so at Chapman University, where I now teach, I have been very fortunate to have uh, been given the permission to really integrate what I feel is the cutting brain science research, align it with what I call you know, contemplative practices, timeless spiritual traditions, and apply them into the, ped into the pedagogy of, of, our, of, of, of our students and also to our faculty at Chapman as well. Um, some of you may be aware as educators, if you haven't um, uh, already, if you don't know about this, in the past 10 years, the past decade, there has been a 56% increase in the suicide rates of children between the age of 10 to 25. And so as educators, and depression rates have gone up 64%. Now, there are, it's too complex to talk about what are the factors that contribute to the rise in depression and anxiety and suicide. But I think as maybe today what we can maybe talk about are some of the ways we can, as educators, we can begin to uh, address what I call this epidemic, this, this, this crisis of happiness, if you will, that uh, we're seeing um, uh, in our youth. Uh, as an educator at the university level, I find that many of the students coming in as freshmen aren't equipped with the tools for resilience, for the tools to be ready. I call it the new three hours of education, my previous um, talk I gave to the high school students. The new three hours of education really are readiness, resilience, and reflection. And so I know the C learning, the C curriculum that uh, you do at the high school, but also the other variations of it that are done at junior high and the elementary school are so crucial. They're so vital at this stage. Um, I study the brain, and I'll talk more about the brain in the context of the conversation, but one thing I'd like to share with you to start this conversation is that the brain develops continues to develop until the age of 25. So we are, as educators, my, myself included, um, as a university educator, we're at this critical um, stage of neural development for our students. And to, to, to make sure that they are equipped and to make sure that they are actually prepared to go out into the world is crucial. One very powerful, uh, I think discovery, you can say, that has come out in the past 20, 30 years about the human brain, we never really understood much about the brain until we actually got medical technology that could actually look into the brain in real time. Previously, we had to look at the brain through autopsy, through perhaps, you know, just uh, post-mortem. Post, post, post but now we, look, we can look what's happening in the brain in real time. And one thing that we're discovering, this is just one of many things I hope to share with you today in the context of, today, of this panel, there's a concept called neuroplasticity. Can, can I get a show of hands to, for anyone who's heard of this concept before? Oh, great, a lot of you know what this is, which is perfect. What this really means is the brain actually rewires itself. It can, the, the brain is always uh, adapting, it's forming new connections. And so 
I think what we're doing here, what we're all trying to do, in addition to, uh, you know, uh, teaching our children about, um, uh, you know, like, uh, the, the importance of academic or cognitive learning, there are so many aspects of learning. I like to think learning happens outside the classroom. And so there are other ways in which we can begin to instill um, and generate the new, the, the next, um, you know, um, the next body of, 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 of our next generation, if you will, of, 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 uh, of, um, uh, of uh, people. And to really begin to understand that there, there's more to learning than just GPA. There's more, there's more to, uh, I think, education than making sure students get a good GPA or learn how to perform quadratic equations or learning about how to play music or how to, you know, how to read Shakespeare. There's much more about the learning process, which we're hopefully we'll get to do today. The last thing I'll maybe say before we open up to conversation, discussion, which I'm happy to talk more about the brain science as well. There's one other component about the brain that we're discovering, and that is the human brain fundamentally evolved as a social organ. This is something relatively new, which I talk about in my book, Science of a Happy Brain. Let me put this into a context for you. Um, picture yourself or imagine yourself going back 10,000 years ago to the age of our Stone Age ancestors or to our caveman, you know, cave, per, cave people dwellers. You're all by yourself. It's cold, you're hungry, you're tired. You, you're, you're, you're all alone and it's getting dark, it's make it worse. There are sounds of hungry predators on the horizon. Pretty scary, right? Now, raise your hand if you believe or feel your chances for survival would increase if you had just one other able-bodied person you can trust. Raise your hand. Yes. Imagine you had five, 10, 50, 100, the whole concept of tribe. This is where we're understanding, I'll talk more about, it's in my book, but I'm happy to talk more about it today in, this, in, in the context of this uh, panel. We have to understand something very important about students and the developing brain of students as well. The importance of community. We're all part of this process. Uh, it's not just educators, it's peers, it's family, it's, it, takes, it takes a village, and it really does. And we're finding that in the lack, or when students, or students specifically, lack that social support, that sense of feeling belonging, that sense of community, literally the brain dysregulates. And this now becomes the foundation I'm seeing in my research and other people's research as well, this becomes the foundation for the anger, the anxiety, the addiction, the trauma, the, the depression, the, the emotional, mental uh, dysregulation takes place. So I can talk on and on and on about this, but um, I, I know we have a, a lot to talk about today. So I think I'll maybe just stop here and happy to maybe just turn it over to our panelists or even Q&A, how we all proceed. Any questions? questions yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it? Well, I know this is okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, uh, it's 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 uh, it's developing. I know Emory University began this program a few years ago, uh, where I teach at Chapman. There, I, I'm just going to be uh, starting in just about a few weeks. I'm going to be initiating a new program, uh, contemplative practices and well-being, and I, I feel that educators or, or the the educational system here in the U.S. is just starting to recognize the 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 not just the value but the necessity of having programs like C or other similar programs. So I can't really answer that question because it's still 
in the inception phase. But from the, the, from the research that is taking place from the, in just a few years that we have been able to study this, there is inarguably solid evidence to, to show that contemplative practices, whether it's through C or whether it's through mindfulness, and there are variations of this, you know, where I teach at Chapman, we're really trying to be inclusive and call these contemplative practices, which can in include mindfulness, it can include meditation, it can include art, dance, prayer, gratitude, compassion, all these things which were like, fall under the number of contemplative practices. But what we are finding is that students, the earlier, the earlier you can instill these practices into students, this is crucial for the long term, not just their cognitive development, but their moral, ethical, emotional, psychological, um, social development. And if I could piggyback off that, I think uh, whether it's C or any other uh, curriculum, it at least creates a platform to uh, destigmatize mental health, to have these conversations, to normalize all these um, obstacles and challenges that our students are facing, that um, our communities are facing. And to understand, I like your point, Dr. J, in your book, that overcoming obstacles and challenge does build resilience. Mm -hmm. And sending that message that that actually makes us stronger, uh, more equipped, uh, better human beings. Yeah. You know, I like to say, um, how, many of you, how many of you here have had broken a bone? Anyone? Okay. So there, there's, you know that once the bone breaks, it actually becomes stronger. Uh, if you have the flu virus, you now have a, an immunity to that virus. So we can think of this, we've always, we've always known that um, resilience happens biologically in the body. It's just a, it's just a natural form of uh, survival. But what we're just beginning to discover is that adversity and obstacles have a very similar function. They, can, they allow us to build that sense of resilience uh, in the brain. So when we do encounter, or when we or students do encounter obstacles or challenges, in my case, I, the trauma after my mother's suicide, if I had the tools growing up or in, in high school or in, in junior high, I, I really feel I would have, it would have helped me overcome uh, uh, or give me a better coping mechanism to deal with the trauma. It took me a long while. I mean, I, I, I'm very brutally honest in the book. I went through years of depression, anxiety, addiction uh, in the aftermath of that because I didn't have the tools. I had to discover them on my own. Flash forward 20 years later, here I am talking about this, you know, publicly. But I think um, Lauren, 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 I think has a very key point. It's we need to remove the stigma around mental illness, whether that is emotional, uh, behavioral, psychological, you know, uh, disorders. Um, I t it's, the, it's the reason why I'm so candid for the first time talking about, about my uh, mother's death and my, my response to that, um, that the whole you know, shut up and suck it up attitude, it doesn't work. And I wanted to add that, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you're with the kids most of the day, most of the week, so the burden or the responsibility may fall on to you to help, you know, demystify mental illness and to take away the stigma. And that's got to be extremely challenging to do when you're trying to teach and manage a classroom. But the reality is, is that you know these kids the best. And so what better messenger than you guys or us? Well, and I would just add just that connection, that relationship that you all build with students is huge. Because um, as you were saying, that, that community, that connection piece, that sense of belonging um, is just so beneficial. If, if, sorry, if I could just say one thing, this is, this is research in the book as well. Um, we all have, 
we've all been told as educators, but also as people, the value and the importance of you know getting a good night's sleep, you know, diet, medita- exercise, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but something remarkable, again, this, this, this validates the idea why the human brain develops as, develop as a social organ. We're finding that people who have a strong sense of belonging or feel that they are part of something larger than themselves have a 50% greater chance for longevity than smoking, obesity, uh, or you know, proper diet, et cetera, combined. So, the, so if, if anything that we as educators can do, you know, it's clearly to make sure that our students feel that sense of they belong, that sense of they're part of, a, they're part of something larger. I really enjoyed the metaphor of when you said negative thoughts are like um, Velcro. Velcro and then <laughs> positive thoughts are Teflon. And I wondered if you could share that with oh, the, yeah. the staff. But also if you could provide some other applicable sort of um, things that we could do. I know you mentioned gratitude to the high school students, but things to kind of counteract those negative thoughts I Mm -hmm. thought would be great. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a concept called the brain's negativity bias. And what this means is the phrase, tell me your name? Jane. 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 As Jane mentioned, uh, your brain is like Velcro for, for, for negative experiences and like Teflon for positive ones. Your brain remembers and registers more strongly negative experiences over positive ones, and it had to for survival. So the point I make is, you know, again, going back to that, that Stone Age, you know, time of our, of our ancestors, you ate that poison berry, you almost died. You had to remember that for your survival. Uh, the guy with the menacing look on his face with the club, don't make friends with that guy. He's not a good person. You have to remember these things versus it's a pretty sunrise or look how beautiful the day is. So we actually, and then what they're finding in the research is that it takes around five empowering thoughts to, or behavioral practices to be more precise to outweigh a negative one. So um, let me give an example. Uh, if you have a, so you have a student, for example, uh, and that student might not be doing well in your class. There are other ways you can, you can reinforce positive messages to that student in, in various forms. But the question that Jane asked, even for yourself, so gratitude, we're finding, is one way to do this. So one very simple thing I do, and this is my cheat sheet, I actually have on my bathroom mirror a, a post-it of five things that I'm grateful for. It sounds cheesy and really corny, I know, but it actually does work. Because you wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I almost see, or have it on your, on your cell phone. This is something you can do for your students as well. Just write down five positive things you're grateful for. Let me say something. No, well, working with our, our students, I mean, it's so clear. I mean, our human nature is we, we resort back to that negativity, and it's, that's what sticks with us. So just to be conscious about being grateful, having that positivity, and like you were saying, it seems so simple, but having that list out, it just makes us conscious of it, mm-hmm. and really practicing that um, and honing in on it, it just helps encourage that and rewires our, our neurotransmitters into that neuro uh, that plasticity to rewire our brains to thinking in that way and thinking in that uh, gratitude and positivity. Mm-hmm. Just one more thing to Jane. You had a really good question, a question about what can we as educators do for ourselves? That was a question you had as well. Um, I have now been grateful to pract- have been practicing a meditation technique for the past 25 years now. Uh, it's something that I realized after my mother's death was crucial. And I find that Having, and it doesn't meditation, it means something that you find gives you that sense of inner solace, that inner calm. I mean, you live, I'm, I live in Southern California, which is, I live by the ocean, which is great, but you also have access to the best antidote to stress right outside your house, and that is nature. Uh, just being in nature, Cell phones away, by the way, no cell phones, no distraction for 10 minutes, puts your brains, you can do this for your, you can tell your students to do this as well, 
it puts the brain into, it gets it out of that fight or flight mechanism and puts it into the calm, relax. So it goes from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic, which is part of the vagus nerve. Um, but the idea is that there are, there are very easy and practical techniques that we can start doing, but as, as I think as everyone's here is saying, happiness is not a promise, it's a practice. And you have to practice it. You can't, is, is it like, as if, you know, to, to playing the piano or learning how to swim or learning how to uh, speaking French, you know, you just don't wake up saying, oh, I'm going to speak French today or I'm going to play the piano. You have to practice it. So any habit or any behavior that you yourself want to embody, it does take practice. But there are simple things you can do. Like one is even just deep belly breathing. They're showing that just doing deep belly breathing for just as you just the, 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 the mindful minute that Megan let us in. Just that recalibrates your brain. Um, and I'll say this to you here. I, did, I, did, I didn't do this with, my, with the students. My favorite form of comfort is LSD, laugh, sing, and dance. <laughs> okay, so, so I did say to the students, but uh, L, do more LSD, laugh, sing, and dance. Uh, it really is powerful. And you know, you, your brain, you can't laugh and be depressed at the same time. There's, there's something, or just even social connection. You know, there, there are very, very simple uh, strategies and tools we can begin to implement as educators. Just being out in nature, being, having your gratitude list, um, take five deep breaths, uh, just do more LSD. You know, just little things like this. And they, they do actually, or even better, if you have a contemplative practice, do it. One of the other things that we're finding uh, in the research that really helps to um, give a sense of that solace and comfort is obviously sleep. So as educators, I, send, I tend to forget sometimes, I need to get a good night's sleep. So just, it's self-care. If you want, if you care about your students, you have to practice self-care. Question for you, Dr. Kumar. Um, you spoke about how our students are kind of experiencing this plague of perfectionism. And so I was wondering what it looks like in your classes to practice resiliency, failure, and ultimately success. Can you read the last part, please? Um, what's it look like in your classes that you teach where students are practicing resiliency, failure, and ultimately success? Okay. So the class sizes that we have at Chapman are pretty small, so I'm not sure. What are the general class sizes you have here? What are Generally, 2020. That's what we have as well. So the nice thing is, I get to actually know each of my students pretty one on one. And the first thing we do, and this is something I I've begun, I've, I began to do, I I, be, I I began almost the first um, time I was started teaching at the university level almost uh, 10 years ago, is taking that first five minutes, and we actually do a centering technique exercise. Do you do, is it, are you, do you do this here at, at also? Okay, some teachers do. Uh, what I find is that students at first find it to be really kind of awkward, but eventually they become very eager to, to, to be part of this. But to answer the second question, how do you promote the sense of resilience? Well, the first thing is making students understand that they have control over their you know, emotions. They have the ability to do so. They're not, they're not, they don't have to be hijacked by any little you know, negative thing that takes place. So I talked about earlier, you know, like, um, think of like your, how your car has a suspension system, that, that um, uh, shock absorbers. If your car doesn't have good shock absorbers, every little bump in the road is gonna feel like a head-on collision. And so the one thing that we do, I do, is make students understand, and unfortunately, the cor I'm very fortunate the courses I teach really dive deep into these practices, so I can't speak for every one of my, my, my colleagues at Chapman, but at least I begin to um, uh, instill to the students it's okay to fail. Like failure, you're not gonna be defined, you know, I say this really clearly, at the end of your life, you're not gonna be 
stressing about, I got a C in my algebra test. You know, so it makes students be aware that you're not defined by the drama of the day. It's just momentary. And this is where I think, if I can say this, this is where my personal spiritual practice comes in. I was raised in a, in a, in a Hindu, in, I was raised Hindu, but I also have a PhD in Eastern philosophy and religions. religions. There's a concept in Buddhism, if, if, I can, if, I, if I can maybe just share this with you. It's the idea of, imp of like, this idea that nothing is permanent. Everything is temporary, including whatever emotion you're feeling right now. So the joke I say is, how do you make a sad person happy and a happy person sad? Just tell them what you're feeling will soon pass. Okay? So if I, this is a very roundabout answer. One of the key concepts I instill into my students is this Buddhist idea. I don't, you don't have to call it Buddhist. You can say the idea that everything you're feeling is temporary. It's not going to last. So if you feel a sense of failure, you, a failure you didn't do as well on a, te on a quiz or a test, or you didn't get into college of your choice, or whatever the case might be, you, you're, 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 the girl you asked to the prom didn't, sit, didn't say yes, you know, this is not the end of the world. This is just temporary. Like everything, it all passes. And when you can be, when you, when you, when students begin to appreciate and hear this over and over again, this is just temporary what you're experiencing, it'll soon pass. The more they hear it, the more it begins to actually have an effect. We have a question over here. Hi, um, thank you for being here. My name is Lisa Demento and we, I am at the Aspen Elementary School and we do the Mind Up curriculum here, just to let you know that it is practiced Great. in our school. But my question, and it did get answered partly, by the last question, but you had mentioned 56% increase in suicides in the past 10 years. And uh, Lori Santos, who taught the science of well-being, also said there has been a 400% increase in prescriptions of Prozac and mood elevators since the mid-1990s. Um, do you address what is it, the, just this short 10 year period? Kids have been getting into college and GPAs have been around for a long time. I've got two kids that have one in, as out of college, one in college. GPAs and grades are not going away. Mm -hmm. So do you, what, what is this in 10 year, the past 10 years? And what, what kind of roadblocks can be put in place so the next 10 years we don't encounter this huge rise in mm -hmm. mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Does someone else be more? I, oh, yeah, well, yeah, you are. Talk about that. Talk about it. Yeah. And I'll talk more about it. Technology. <laughs> it's not, I don't think it's the end all be all. <clears throat> I don't think it's fair just to blame everything on technology. But if you look at the differences between what you're saying, you know, 10 or 20 years ago to now, um, I don't know, maybe the structure of the, the family and the availability of people at home and all that, all those factors, but also the immediacy of technology and the impulsivity involved. Kids can go on. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and look at who was accepted into what college and then immediately compare themselves to that person. I don't think that was happening 15 years ago. If it was, it was more in slow motion, like you, you talk about it or you write about it and maybe share it, but just the, the way the brain works and the instant gratification you get is, I think, yeah. is playing a really huge role. Right. There's a system in the brain called the, I'll, I'll just say it for what it is, it's called the dopaminergic reward system. It's the dopamine, the neurotransmitter dopamine. And what we're finding in the research around um, technology, whenever you receive, and this is not just you, but whenever a student maybe gets like a like on Instagram or just gets that tweet from, you know, someone, it instantly releases dopamine into the body. And so this becomes a form of addiction. This this, this, this um, puts the brain in this primal survival state. And so when you're in that primal survival state, you can't begin to think cognitively about, you know, rationalize, make proper decisions. Um, so this is maybe an answer to your question. Um, 
I find in my research, and this is just my research I'm finding, so I'm not saying it's the definitive answer. There are complex factors, I think, that, 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 that converge that are um, manifesting as the spike in, in, in suicide rates uh, among, among the age 10 to 25 year olds. Technology, I think, is a major culprit, and this is why I believe it is. Um, any device that travels with you is a weapon for addiction. I'm, oh, one, so one, when, oh, someone had a question about the earlier thing about how one thing I do in my classroom. I'm not sure if you do it here. I have a very strict no technology in the classroom. So, I mean, you can use computers for taking notes. All cell phones are turned off. And I'm not sure, is that a policy here you have as well? Yeah. Okay, the high school, yeah. It, and middle school too. Good, 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 good. Because <laughs> it's it's difficult because they're so. It's for for many students. They they've done they've done studies. Their mobile devices are like this fifth appendage for them. It's like a limb to them. They don't know how to live without it. And so, when you have technology, and and, and I, I know um, when you see like oh your best friend got into the university that you wanted to get into, but you didn't. That social comparison, this idea of like, everyone's got the best life on, 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 on social media, on Instagram, but my life kind of sucks. So it really portrays a very negative, um, you know, I think persona of who we are. And I think, you know, everyone tries, students at least, at least the people that we're talking about, and university students myself as well, they really try and project this perfectionist persona of their perfect self. I would love for someone just to suppose I'm having a really crappy day today <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> but aside from that, there is a very, there's a lot of research that, is, that's, that's, that indicates that the rise in technology, the rise in digital uh, accessibility, as I said earlier, any, any device, anything that you, that you can carry with you or travels with you is a weapon for addiction. And cell phones or technology is one of them. And when you have, when you're in that, when the brain is in that dopaminergic reward system 24 seven, it's really hard for anything else to take place. So this is why practices, whether it's mind up, or C, or contemplative practices, what they do is they help students to find that sense of, um, what's what I'm looking for, uh, a mechanism or an outlet. So they're not in this hyped up, vigilant, you know, like dopaminergic reward state. I also just wanted to add that I think because of the accessibility of technology like we were talking about, kids are on it all the time and so they're constantly reminded of the stigma and have that pressure to be perfect and so they're not talking about the adverse experiences that they've had in their life, whether it's family separation due to divorce or separation, a family member was deported or incarcerated, they're not talking about the things that happened in their neighborhood that were scary, they're not talking about certain things because they do feel that pressure to project everything's fine, I got this, my family's got this, and I don't want to talk about it. And when we don't talk about it, that's when we see the lack of resiliency and taking responsibility and keeping our control in these situations or reaching out and saying, I don't have control and I need help. It's the rule. Um, I was wondering about um, the effects of adult involvement in children's lives. I saw Screenagers 2 and one of the studies showed that you know, when children were trying to solve problems, <laughs> As soon as their parents stepped in, the children's stress skyrocketed, and the parents' stress went down. Um, and so, which is so, I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, in you know, in my interactions with students and my own children, and I was just wondering if you had more information about that. I mean, it was just a short little excerpt of that film, but it 
was pretty impactful. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that in the last 10 years as well, of helicopter parents, or what do we call now lawnmower parents? Lawnmower. Get in my way and I will cut you down, right? <laughs> so um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Thanks. I actually had a really funny experience with the third grader yesterday where I was the person doing the hard thing and he was the one teaching me, but he took the scissors from me. He took the paper from me and said, Miss Amy, this is how you do it. We have to fight that urge to fix things. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to fight it because we do. We have great coping skills. We have great strategies, but our students need to learn them sometimes the hard way with healthy risk. You know, you're not gonna let them get severely hurt, but we have to be able to step back and say, no, this isn't about me. This is about your learning. And sometimes they will fail and our anxiety is gonna keep raising, but we just have to notice, you know, this isn't about me and they really need me to step back and let them just learn. Um, and one other thing, I have been really interested in some research about healthy relationships and how um, it does not have to be a family member or a biological person in your life that can make a profound impact on your life. And the research with rats has shown that certain rats were taken from a mother that was not naturally nurturing and their outcomes were just very poor and they put them with a new mother that was very nurturing and they were eating, playing, they were doing rat things, you know, <laughs> so they just had better outcomes in terms of their life and longevity as a rat and the, so they're comparing that to our relationships with our students. You don't have to know everything about a student to form a relationship, that's the point of forming the relationship. You just get in there, get awkward with them and just start. <laughs> I find that one of the, uh, and th something I think Amy, I'll, I'll just actually elaborate on about the social brain um, hypothesis. Uh, in the past uh, 15 years or so, we've discovered this aspect of, about the brain. The brain is not, we've always thought the brain is a, is a, maybe as a cognitive organ and maybe as an emotional organ, but fundamentally it is a social organ. So let me give you one bit of research as to how this idea came about. In 2003, UCLA, they did a study by putting subjects into a fMRI machine, which can measure brain activity in real time. And they, 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 they did this, uh, they, they uh, elicited what we call social, um, uh, social pain. So the idea of like, you know, in, in this, in this, in this, in this uh, experiment, this person was, um, playing this virtual game, uh, having a ball passed to them virtually, and all of a sudden, the ball stopped getting passed to them. So they experienced social exclusion, social rejection. And so the aim of the study was to see what part of the brain fires or processes this social rejection. And this um, just really, uh, well, I'll say this. So the part of the brain that, uh, pro that, that processes social pain, so social rejection, social exclusion, is the same part of the brain that processes physical pain. Now the intensity of being dumped by, you know, you know your girlfriend or you're having, being fired, it's not as maybe the, 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 the acuteness of the pain is not maybe similar as maybe having, you know, like your, your toe broken or something or jamming your, your head into the wall banging your hand to the wall. But the human brain understands, or put it this way, I'll, I'll backtrack. Any functional strategy that enhances survival gets, got passed down into the genes of the next generation. So there's a reason why opposable thumbs, walking upright, having vocal cords were so crucial for humans to survive. And the same thing is now happening <clears throat> regarding the social brain, the, social, the, the brain being a social organ. But something else was discovered in the same experiment. Your brain actually releases opioids when it experiences pain. So when you break a bone or you, you know, bang your thumb when you're nailing a hammer, you know, nail, you know trying to hammer a nail into the wall, um, your brain will produce opioids. 
So there's a part of the brain that releases or regulates physical pain. And what they found is that the same region of the brain that regulates physical pain also regulates social pain as well. So pain is all the same in the brain, whether it's physical pain, um, social pain, emotional pain, it all registers and processes and regulates the same part of the brain. So the idea that Amy was saying about the rats, you know, this is a common feature of all mammals. All mammals, including uh, higher mammals like primates, especially humans, there's one thing we humans surpass more so than any that, that's, that's um, excelled at. We're not the strongest of animals. We're not the fastest. We're not, we can't breathe underwater. We can't fly. But there's one feature of humans that surpassed, that we surpassed and excel at more so than any other species, and that is the ability for complex social behavior. We understood this. The brain understands this. And so when a student or when anyone, let's say in this example, a student, when a student feels that he or she has that sense of belonging, that sense of, I think the big thing is trust. If they can trust you, this is the most important, crucial aspect of their long-term future health, success, and well-being, and happiness. Um, I'm sitting up here and I'm listening to you say that belonging is really important and nature is really important and taking away cell phones is really important and all these things. And I'm sitting up here thinking, we do this mm -hmm. when we do outdoor ed. Every time we do outdoor ed, all of us from kindergarten all the way up do all these things. So if we took the values, no rushing, no pressure, you know, all that stuff, presenting a little bit of adversity, we put packs on eighth graders that are bigger than they are, and push through it as a team, if we, then, then they feel like they belong to that group. Mm -hmm. If we lead our classrooms more like we do outdoor ed, I think it'll help a lot. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. The sense that you're part, you're doing this together. One of the things I know as a teacher is we're in constant competition, regardless of whether or not we have cell phones in our classrooms with technology. Um, so one of my th questions is, how do you m mitigate the extrinsic use of technology in your classroom, and how do you help parents with mitigating technology use within the home? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So uh, I do, as I said, I make it a very strict policy in all my classes, no cell phones out. In fact, I, all, I have all students take their cell phones out, turn them off, and put them away. If I see them, they actually get a point deduction if I see them with their cell phones out. So it's a little bit of a threat, I know. But let me say this, regarding students, the brain of a child is like a sponge. It's to, to whatever it sees in its environment. If parents are telling their kids, get off your phone at the dinner table, but they're doing the same thing, it is not going to help. So as, 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 as you, you know, at the home, it really starts, I feel, if parents recognize the importance of, of, of not having kids be addicted to their devices. Uh, it starts at home. It starts with uh, role models. It starts with that sense of you know, uh, learned behavior. If, if students see us putting our phones away and being present and being attentive and being mindful and being you know, uh, attuned to their issue and not being distracted all the time, it actually has a powerful effect on their behavior as well. Uh, we can't, I can't, we can't, you know, ask every parent, you know, to, to enforce having a no cell phone policy <laughs> at the dinner table or at home. But, you know, one thing I'm going to say tonight at the public talk for parents, 
I really feel there needs to be one night a week at the dinner table where no one has technology. No one, not even the parents. Every, every night. Every night, but starts one night. Starts one night, but you build on that. So, so there are ways in which all of us can do this together. And as I said, you know, because the brain is a social organ, we students that, that until the age of 25 or 26, the brain is developing and still trying to navigate the terrain of like, you know, what's, what's right, what's wrong, what do I do, how do I navigate my world? But when students see educators being off their devices, being present in the classroom and being attuned to them, and of course, of course at home as well with their, with, their, with their parents, it does actually have a profound effect. Every little thing does help. Well, we're, we're at time, and I want to get the final word here. Dr. Kumar, I just have to ask this question. If the brain is developed for survival over time, how do we become happy? Be oh, happy. Ha I'm having a hard time hearing. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. So this is where I call the four C's. So I, I, we, we talk about, I talk about happiness is not a promise. It is a practice. You have to practice this regularly. Like any behavior you want to... Uh, embody in your life. So I talk about the four C's. There's, the, there's comfort, contribution, connection, and compassion. And I find these four C's as, as, as my, for myself. Comfort is understanding that it's not just taking comfort and getting a good night's sleep or getting good night, you know, good night's rest. It's taking comfort from others in times of distress. So no longer have that stigma we talk about. Contribution. Knowing that you add value and meaning and purpose into the world. It doesn't matter if you're a teacher or if you were, you're a cashier at Walmart or an ER doctor. Every single one of us has a, an important role and function in this world. A very important reminder to all of our students. Not everyone's going to be the CEO of the next Microsoft or Apple. Not everyone's going to be uh, an ER doctor or whatever, but everyone has a purpose and a function. So that's contribution. Connection. Very clearly, we talked about the brain being a social organ. Connecting to others, that sense of social connection, but also connection to nature. Connection to things that really bring you a sense of joy and well-being. And the last is compassion. We're in, an, we're in, an, in, a, in a, an election year right now, 2020. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm finding that there is this very um, hostile, tense environment that we're living. You all know, you all, you all feel that, that, that sense of tribalism, that sense of um, factionalism. But one thing I find that compassion does is that it reminds us that all of us are seeking the same primary goals in life. We all want to thrive. We all want to be happy. We all want our kids to be well-adjusted. And if there's one thing we can all remember, regardless of how you love, how you pray, how you, you know, vote, uh, there's far more that unites us than divides us. And I think with that, I'll just say this, you know, um, never be afraid to let your light and your power to shine forth fully and brightly because the world would be a much dimmer place without you in it.